And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Nori with you. Martin Ford back with us, founder of a Silicon Valley-based software development firm. He has more than 25 years' experience in the fields of computer design and software development, holds a computer engineering degree from the University of Michigan, graduate business degree from the University of California. He is a frequent keynote speaker on the subject of accelerating progress in robotics and artificial intelligence and what these advances mean for the economy, job market, and society of the future. Martin, welcome back. How are you, sir? I'm good. Thanks for having me back. I'm looking forward to this. Is artificial intelligence a good or bad thing? What do you think? Well, I think it's a good thing, but I also think it has two sides to it. You know, it's, it's going to be indispensable to us um, to solve all the problems we face in the future. You know, we've got things going on like climate change. We're going to need a lot of innovation to um, to mitigate that, to, to have clean energy and things like that, but also to adapt to it. We're really going to need all kinds of inventions, all kinds of innovations, and artificial intelligence will help us do that because what it will do is it will make us smarter. You know, it will it will make even the smartest people more capable. It will amplify their intelligence, their creativity, and we're already seeing that in, in, in many areas. Um, you know, AI is being used to discover new drugs, new medicines, for example. Um, so I think it's it's a tremendously positive thing. But there are a whole bunch of issues that come with it, um, some dangers, some real concerns that we're going to have to work through and, um, you know, figure out the answers to to, to make sure that, that it remains a, a positive force for us. Would that include job security for people? Absolutely. That's one of the main things is that um, a lot of jobs are basically going to be automated. You know, if you're coming to work and you're doing something that's predictable and routine, if you tend to do the same kind of thing again and again, then eventually machines, algorithms are going to get good at doing that. And, and the thing is, it doesn't matter if you're working in McDonald's, you know, doing something, you know, manual, mm -hmm. or if you're working in an office sitting in front of a computer doing something routine just with information. Actually, that, that second job might in many cases be easier to automate because you don't need, you know, an expensive robot or, or anything like that. It's just software. So a lot of what, what people consider to be good jobs, white-collar jobs, sitting in front of a laptop, cranking out the same report again and again, that kind of thing, um, jobs that, that require, in many cases, a college degree, those jobs are also going to be um, potentially threatened by this. Some fast food outlets already, Martin, are coming up with uh, innovation with robotic uh, food handling machines and things like that. That's right. Yeah, uh, White Castle was the, the the most famous one recently that brought in robots to flip the hamburgers, and then they've also got a, a a machine that automates the French fries too. So you know, they're they're. I definitely we're we're going to see more and more restaurants and fast food places move in that direction. One of the things that's accelerating it is the pandemic, right? That you know, it's really changed the way we think about things, right? Now it's not so great if a lot of people are are in close proximity in the kitchen, or if a lot of people are in contact with your food, right? People have, you know, preferences have really kind of changed as a result of of this pandemic. And I think as a result of that, people are going to be a lot more open to dealing with robots or, or automation rather than people. Martin, what do you think is self-driving vehicles? I think eventually it will work and it will be a very important technology. Um, but I do think it's going to take longer than like, a, you know, a lot of people have, have projected. Um, this has been going on for a long time, right? The first self-driving cars came along in 2009, 2010. Um, and they, back then they were saying it was going to be five years. And, of course, it's now more than 10 years. And we're still not, not really yet there yet. I think it's probably at least another five years, maybe even more than that, before you really have true self-driving cars. You'll see very, you know, in Arizona, in Phoenix, where... You know, the, the roads are very wide and, and the weather is, you know, it never snows. Right. Um, there are not a lot of pedestrians because it's very hot. Um, you know, it's a good, easy environment for self-driving cars. And they do have some experiments going on there. You know, we, we, you know Waymo, uh, Google's original self-driving car project, has, has an actual program going there where you can get in a car with no driver and go a short distance. But it's it's a very constrained map. You know, you can you can go to certain places um, within a very specific region. But the idea that we're going to really have a robotic Uber or Lyft, you know, in San Francisco or, or, or Manhattan 
is still a long way off. I mean, the, the problems that need to be solved there are just, you know, very, very challenging. I mean, Tesla came up with a vehicle, but there have been some fatalities involved, haven't there? That's right. They, there have been several people... Um, Run over. That, that have, yeah, they've died or, or drivers have been killed. The first, the very first one to be killed was was using the autonomous system to drive. And, and from what I heard, was watching a movie. I think it was actually a Harry Potter movie and not paying attention at all and drove into the side of a truck, right? So there, there have been a lot of these instances. Thinking the vehicle um, was going to take care of everything, right? Right, right. But the cameras on the vehicle couldn't, maybe because of the way the sun was shining on the truck or something, it didn't it didn't recognize it, so it just drove right into the side of it. Um, so you, you there are these, these incidents, and, um, you know, Tesla has really pushed the envelope on this because what, what they basically do is, first of all, they're, they're pre-selling their self-driving capability. You know, Elon Musk is out there telling people that their cars are going to completely drive themselves if only they pay, I think it's something like $10,000 extra for this software package, right? And so people are paying this money. And But, of course, it doesn't work. I mean, it does some things, but it's not even remotely close to being a true, truly autonomous self-driving solution. But then what they do is they keep uh, allowing people to download updates, right? And then the whole capability of the car changes each time they have an update. And and people, I think, can be very easily lured into to imagining that this car is more capable than it really is, right? And then they become they'll they'll rely on it when they really shouldn't. Um, so I, I actually I think that's quite dangerous and really to some extent irresponsible for for Tesla to do that. And it, there's a real danger that. There will be, you know, really serious accidents or something in the future, and that could kind of derail the whole industry, you know, that people will, you know, or the regulators will step in and really put the brakes on this, you know, and, and that will slow down progress. So We've got lots of nighttime uh, truck drivers, uh, Martin, that listen to this program, and we are, you know, supporters of our truck drivers. They keep America going, and we keep hearing stories of driverless trucks. I think that's crazy. Yeah, I mean, I think eventually we'll see that. I still think it's a ways off. I mean, I, for one thing, you, you think about how much a truck weighs and, and, and how much energy it has, you know, traveling down the highway at 60 miles an hour or something. I don't think a lot of people are going to easily accept the idea of a massive truck like that, you know, correct. You know, oh, plus I've going seen down the highway at that kind of speed with absolutely no one on board, you know. I, I well, mean, and, and a lot of these drivers also unload the cargo. Exactly right, right. That's right. And uh, so I do think, you know, there'll be an in initial phase where the, maybe the truck can pretty much drive itself, but the driver still has to be there. And that might make drivers, maybe, you know, maybe that's easier for drivers, but it might be also kind of boring. You know, drivers will become a little bit more like what you see with airline pilots, right, which is that they really don't spend a lot of time actually flying the plane. You know, most of it is, is the autopilot system, which can take off and land and pretty much do everything, but the, you still got to have two pilots there. Um, and one thing that's happened as well. Well, I tell you what I won't jump into is a pilotless plane. Right, right. I think most people wouldn't. But the thing is that in many ways, uh, you know, having an autonomous plane, which just flies through the air and doesn't deal with traffic, is actually an easier problem than a self driving car. I mean, uh, if you think about it, um, Until something yeah, goes wrong, then in, then what happens? Right, a car driving in traffic. I mean, you've got you've got a whole many many more scenarios that that you had to deal with constantly, right? Um, but you're right. I think you know most people would would be scared to get on the plane with no no pilots, um, and I think a lot of people will be scared to share the road with with massive trucks that don't have a driver. Uh, ex yeah, especially in that, cold times. Out than people are imagining. You know, it's going to take a little longer. Martin, stay with us. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll come back. Martin Ford has a couple books out called Rule of the Robots. The other is called Rise of the Robots. He was uh, with me back about five years ago when we talked about artificial intelligence. Let's see how much we've advanced since five years ago as well. We'll be back in a moment right here on Coast to Coast AM. And, of course, next hour, we'll take your phone calls with him as well. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Nori with you, Martin Ford with us. We're going to take calls with Martin next hour about artificial intelligence. So make sure you jump on board here. Back to our, our truck drivers, uh, Martin, and uh, talking about artificial intelligence. 
you, yeah. you know, it's, um, at, at some point, it's going to backfire, isn't it? Well, it, it, it won't necessarily backfire, but there, there are things that we need to worry about. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of nefarious ways that artificial intelligence can be used um, and is being used, in fact. If you look at what's happening in China, they're building kind of a, a, a Norwellian surveillance state. You know, they, they're okay. using artificial intelligence, sure. facial recognition to, to keep track of, of their people, to control basically what they do, even what they buy, um, who they associate with, what they post on social media, all that stuff is. How long kids um, can play video games? They're controlling that now. Yeah, exactly. And, and AI is going to be, I mean, it's an incredibly powerful tool for an authoritarian regime like China, right? A, a, if you're a, a government that wants to control your population and and always know what your population is doing, what your people are doing, AI is is a dream come true. Basically, you know, it's it's very very powerful when used for that purpose. So, and and the thing is that China is not is deploying that domestically in their country, but they're also exporting it to other countries. Right, there's especially other author authoritarian countries like in the Middle East and things like that. Um, so it's kind of spreading around the world. And I mean, there is always going to be a trade off, right? If, if you, you, I mean, you can legitimately use things like facial recognition and you can reduce crime, right? You can, you can stop crimes from happening. I mean, these systems have been used, for example, to, to catch pedophiles, you know, people abusing children, stuff like that, which definitely is a good thing. But the other side of that is that it can really be a threat to privacy. So I think that each, you know, each community, each city, each each state, each country is going to have to have kind of a conversation about this and, and decide, you know, well, how far do we want to go with this? You know, what, what are we willing to accept in terms of giving up privacy in order to have more security, less criminals, less terrorists, things like that? Hasn't Elon Musk said some pretty outrageous things about artificial intelligence? He has. He said that artificial intelligence is summoning the demon, and and uh, I think at one sense he says it's more dangerous than North Korea, more dangerous than nuclear weapons. Um, that's not true now. What what he's thinking of is some future scenario where AI reaches you know human level intelligence and then goes beyond that. And we're very far from that now. We can't build, we can do, we can build systems that are, seem to be very smart in very, very specific, narrow ways, you know, that can do very, very specific things. But we haven't built any kind of artificial intelligence that has anything like general human intelligence. And yet people are definitely working on that, you know. I mean, there are a couple of companies out there, uh, DeepMind, which is owned by Google, and, and OpenAI is another one that are both focus specifically on, on doing that, someday building a machine that has human-level intelligence. Now, once you get to that point, people worry that you could lose control of it, right? That, right. that it will suddenly become much smarter than us, not not just equal to us, but it will be, you know, maybe a thousand times smarter than us. You know, we'll be like a mouse, you know, compared to to this this machine, right, in terms of our level of intelligence. And then once that happens, how do we keep control of it, you know? And, um, I mean, what, what most of the people worry about is not so much like the Terminator movie where, you know, you really have these malevolent machines that want to kill us, but rather the, it would just get beyond us and we might ask it to do something for us, but then it, it would act in ways that we didn't intend and, and you know, maybe cause us real harm. Some people even think it could be an existential threat in the, scene, in the sense that it could wipe all of humanity out, uh, you know, out and, and things like that. I, you know, I think that's kind of a legitimate concern, and there are some really smart people working on that. But I do think it's pretty far in the future, so I don't worry about it too much right now. Are Asimov's robotic rules still in effect? They, I mean, they're kind of irrelevant. I mean, I, I, I don't even remember exactly what they are, but the first one is a robot can't kill, right? And yet we're already on the verge of having autonomous weapons. I mean, we already, of course, have remote-controlled robots, drones that kill people, right? And you just saw a you know, very tragic tragedy in Afghanistan. In, in Afghanistan with that, right? And that was, that was a machine that was under human control. Um, but we are very close to the point where 
those machines are going to be unleashed. Um, in fact, there was another article you may have seen in the New York Times, I think it was yesterday or the day before, about the Israelis carried out an assassination um, in Iran of uh, the top, the top, the very top nuclear scientist in Iran, the one that the one that is, uh, you know, in charge of their whole nuclear program, which they deny having. Um, so the Israelis were able to assassinate this guy by hiding um, a robotic machine gun in a truck, basically, on the side of the road. And then they they tracked the guy and, and shot the guy with the machine gun, but it was controlled, I think, from Israel, basically, you know, from a long, long way away, but via satellite. With cameras, I guess, right? Right, exactly. But the thing is that because it had to go via satellite, there was a delay of about a second, I think, between what, what the person – controlling it, saw in the camera, right, and, you know, being able to fire it, right, and there were wind conditions and all of that. So they actually used artificial intelligence to correct for that, to correct for the delay, you know, to, to, to adjust the, the gun so that it could handle, you know, the, the wind conditions, things like that. So that's, you know, getting very close to just saying we'll just let the gun do it do, do its thing by itself, right? And 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 we are really on the verge of that. Um, and you can imagine, for example, usually the way that this is imagined is is in terms of drones, right? So you could have small swarming drones, maybe hundreds of them, maybe even thousands of them, that would swarm and could attack people. And they don't have to have guns on or anything. They could just be little drones that had um, a little um, explosive charge, right? And, and it would, the drone would just fly into you and, and, and kill you. There's actually a, a YouTube video you can watch. It's called Slaughterbots. And it was made by um, a guy named Stuart Russell, who's a professor of, you know, an AI professor at, at UC Berkeley. And he's really worried about this. So he worked on with a team and made this very professional video called Slaughterbots. And you can watch it. And it's really scary. I mean, you, you know, it shows you what, what could happen um, if we really – unleashed autonomous weapons. And the thing, of course, is that they might initially be developed for militaries, right? But then what happens if those weapons fall into the hands of terrorists? That's right. Or and, criminals. Yeah, or criminals or, or, you know, they could be used in all, you know, you already have criminals, you know, you've seen what, doing cyber hacking, holding companies hostage, all that kind of stuff. So you can imagine maybe that kind of thing happening with actual weapons as well. So it, it's quite... A bunch of scary scenarios there. I've got the first uh, three laws of uh, Azamak, and uh, it came out of his book, iRobot. The first law, a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. Second, a robot must obey the orders given to it by human beings, except where such orders could conflict with the first law. Third, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. Well, already these robots have violated these laws because we see what these drones are doing. Yeah, I mean, you can argue that those aren't real robots because they're, they're machines. They're controlled, right? Right. But, but once they become autonomous, and I think that's kind of inevitable. I mean, you know, so far, like the, the U.S. is saying we're not, we're not going to do that. We're going to always keep a person in the loop. Um, but there is an initiative in the United Nations to ban these kinds of weapons, to make, to make autonomous weapons illegal in the same way that um, chemical weapons are, are banned and biological weapons are banned. But actually, that's not making a lot of progress. And the reason is that the three countries that really matter, which are, you know, the United States and Russia and China, no, none of them will go along with a ban, right? They, 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 don't, they don't want to right. ban. The it's got to be all or none. Right. The reason is they don't trust each other, right? I mean, if we... Well, well that's we right. Talk, if, if you if you disarmed all your nukes, somebody's going to keep one. Right, and, right. And, and that's why nobody will trust each other. Exactly, right. So it's a... You know, these, these things are in development, right? And what, what they're saying is, well, we, we'll, we'll develop this technology, you know, in the lab, right, and show that it can work, but then we won't actually ever use it. Um, I mean, hopefully that will be the case, but they, they won't not develop it because they don't trust other countries not to develop it. And, and it is the case that, I mean, these kinds of weapons would be a tremendous advantage, right? I mean, on a battlefield, a machine 
can think a thousand times faster than any human being, maybe a million times faster, right? I mean, in, in the time it takes a person to reach for a button, even and press the button, the, the, the machine, the machine has already pushed ago, the button. Figured everything out and, and taken action, right? So there's no way that that a human being's reaction could ever compete with uh, with, with with a robot, right? If it was just let go to to make decisions for itself. So, I mean, it would be a real advantage for whichever military developed these, and that's the reason that they're not going to, you know, take this off the table. Martin, would you say our smartphones are robots? Uh, they're definitely technology, and they, they they definitely are incorporating artificial intelligence. I mean, they're not they're not robots in the sense of being autonomous themselves, but they are incorporating um, AI. I mean, like a Siri, right? The, the personal assistants, or, or um, I'm amazed, I'm amazed by it. I mean, they they remember your passwords, they remember your usernames, they remember all kinds of things on your phone. It's amazing. How do they do that? Well, it's it's. Yeah, I mean, it's it's advances in artificial intelligence, that, te- that particular technology called deep learning, which is the latest um, trend in, art- in artificial intelligence. It's been about 10 years now that it's really been the primary way things are done, and it's been pretty revolutionary. And that's what powers Siri. That's what powers um, Amazon's, you know, Alexa. Alexa, right? sure. That, you know, that's the t- technology behind that. And, it, and it's now also, um, they're actually making special computer chips specifically for deep learning, for that technology, so they can run faster and faster. And those are used in Teslas, for example, for the self-driving, for the self-driving car, you know, feature. And they're also in, in at least the higher-end smartphones, you know, and, and they're used to power things like Siri. And, and that will only keep advancing, right? So... You know, what we have right now in terms of Siri or Alexa is really pretty rudimentary. I mean, you know, it's not definitely not at the level of like the Star Trek computer, right, where you could really carry on a conversation and and it will talk to you just like a person. Um, But we are going to get closer and closer to that. Um, So, yeah, this is going to be a relentless trend. It is amazing that artificial intelligence at its best is very helpful to us. Oh yeah, it's going to be the, it's going to be the most powerful tool that we have. I mean, it's the most important technology. And, and, and what I argue in my book, um, Rule of the Robots, is that artificial intelligence is eventually going to be almost like electricity. It's going to be everywhere. You know, you think think of what your life would be like if you didn't have electricity, right? I mean, just about everything you do throughout the day, to some extent, relies on electricity, yep. right? Um, or batteries, or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some kind of electric power. I mean, you know, you're 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 plugged into time. So AI will be like that. It will be everywhere, um, and we will grow more and more dependent on it. Uh, so it's going to be a totally revolutionary technology that's really going to shape the future. And I, I, as I say, it's not a bad thing, but there are some scary things that come along with it, right? And we we're going to need you know laws and regulations to deal with these things. Like we we really should do something about those autonomous weapons. If we can't ban them entirely, then we really need to take steps to make absolutely certain that they don't end up in the hands of terrorists. Well, but who knows what's going to happen with that, right? Yeah, I mean, did we expect well, terrorists to command three planes? Exactly. And that and that's the thing is that, that you know, what happened with, with those planes on 9-11 is the terrorists did that with box cutters, right? They, um, they got on with their box and cutters AI, and threatened people. The thing is that AI is closer to a box cutter than to a nuclear weapon in terms of the complexity of it. I mean, I mean, you know, people in a basement somewhere can use it, can use artificial intelligence. They could buy a drone on Amazon and then maybe retrofit that drone, uh, turn it into a weapon, right? It's nothing like nuclear weapons. I mean, nuclear if you want to build a nuclear weapon, you need to be a country, right? Even most countries can't do that, right? Um, it's it's, it's, it's huge, difficult. It's d- difficult to hide. Right, right. But these, you know, things, technologies that involve weaponizing artificial intelligence and drones and things like that. I mean, literally, you could do it in a basement. You know, just one guy or a few people. Um, so it's going to be much harder to control it. Will AI, Martin, find cures for like COVID nineteen? Well, it, it would definitely be a very powerful tool for medicine, and in fact, that's already happening. They're using um, 
AI to discover new drugs? I mean, basically what you're doing is you're searching for molecules, right, that have a particular shape that can do particular things. Um, and AI is really, really good at this. And there have already been, for example, antibiotic, antibiotics um, discovered that with artificial intelligence. And um, so it's going to be, yeah, very powerful for, for that kind of thing. It's going to definitely advance medicine. Um, and it will also be used in other areas like di diagnosis. Um, you know, there are AI systems that can look at medical scans, you know, like uh, x-rays or, or mammograms, things like that, look for cancer. And in some cases, they can do that better than doctors, right? And that's going to get better and better. So these technologies are going to be a boon to medicine, absolutely. Um, 